himself for the union uh, for his peace and human rights activism in 1986. Uh, she eventually, uh, within the same year, found her way to us here at the so fortunate to have her as a colleague. I just learned today, by the way, uh, that you know, next week is the 38th anniversary uh, of her trial uh, in, uh, in the USSR. And uh, we were just talking about that this morning. Um, she moved to Columbus. In 1986, Yuri and two kids, one of whom is up there. You saw a picture of the little guy in there. He looks so different now. Uh, but there's Mike up, uh, up there as well. And um, uh, it was shortly after 1986 that Olga and I met on the campus of the Ohio State University. Starting in 1987, she and here, as I mentioned, and during her 27 years of teaching at Pittsburgh, she taught uh, classes in geography. She is chair of the geography department. She was director of the Russian Central Eurasian Studies program and led her students on at least a dozen uh, international educational experiences uh, to Russia, uh, to the country of Georgia. Uh, and to Canada. Uh, I was fortunate enough to accompany her on most of those. She won the Alumni Award for Distinguished Teaching. Uh, and in uh, 1997, she was promoted to full professor. During this period of time, she also conducted lots of research uh, at the Ohio State University at the Michon Center, where I was also affiliated, and published numerous books and articles on urbanization. Uh, one of her books has just been republished. After 20 years, uh, the publisher decided to, to republish it as part of a series of, of books. This is Rutledge uh, books. She has won two Fulbright Awards one which took her to Moscow to teach, uh, and the other which took her to the country of Georgia, also to teach and do research. So, uh, in a sense, uh, I would say, uh, Olga has come full circle with the film that we just saw, because in 2019, she's approached uh, to reflect upon uh, her work Peace activists. Um, so, this is a very nice completion of that circle of scenario, I would say. Earlier. So, we're going to have a conversation with her right now. Olga, if you would come up. And uh, I'm going to sit here. And, hey, Jerry. Yes, ma'am. Want to be here? Yeah, well, I'm going to be sitting here. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to sit here, and we're just going to chat for a while. And the rules of the game are this. Uh, I'm going to take a question, questions from you uh, and questions from those who are zooming in to this conversation. I'm going to kind of alternate them between you and the virtual uh, reality that we're dealing with these days. And uh, go back and forth, maybe it won't be exactly that way. But when you ask a question, we're here in the audience, and for those of you zooming in, please, uh, please identify yourselves and we're relevant. Uh, tell us what year you graduated from Wittenberg University. <laughs> we're going to uh, uh, end discussion uh, promptly at seven o'clock. Uh, and so uh, please do uh, remember that. I'd like to take uh, advantage of my position as the moderator to ask the first question. Warm everybody up here. Uh, and, um, and it's this, it says, Olga, the film states that the Greenham Common Group 
got in touch with you. But the process of just how that happened, uh, I don't think was made as clear as it might have been in, uh, in the film. At least it wasn't very clear to me. And so I've got a couple of questions. First of all, how did they reach you at first? Through what means? And second, who else from the outside was able to contact your peace group to support and publicize um, your activities? Uh, that's, that's a good question. And it's kind of a short one. There is no short answer to that, but I'll try my best. Uh, we launched our movement in um, summer of 82. I believe it was June 4th, 82. Why am I so specific? Because when we launched it, we invited foreign correspondents along with Soviet correspondents for the opening. Of course, Soviets never came. The Soviet KGB been crawling around the bushes around the building and uh, foreign correspondents came, American, British, German, French, Belgium. And by a very lucky coincidence, Daniel Ellsberg, arrived the same very day to the Leningrad uh, Harbor uh, on a rainbow boat with the banners, Soviets stop nuclear testing. Of course he, he was, uh, for those who don't know who Daniel Ellsberg is, uh, he also has this title as a Pentagon man. He was a military, uh, analyst who leaked Pentagon papers. Uh, actually, he was practically facing an electric chair because it was considered to be treason. But he, uh, those papers been published just to show what the Vietnam was, what Vietnam War was for the United States, for Vietnamese, and it's been a lot of secret papers. And actually he contributed very much to the end of the Vietnam War and also to the end of the Nixon um, government. Uh, anyway, he was thrown out of the Soviet Union, obviously, and somehow Western newspapers, because we also had Western correspondents, pick up two stories and they been both side to side on front pages. Of course, nothing like that it was in Soviet press, obviously. So we kind of became known in a great way, in a very dangerous way, because we've been uh, immediately, our phone, phone's been cut off, our mailbox has been arrested. My husband was arrested as a hooligan, you know, he's, as absent-minded professor as only can be <laughs> and disappeared for two weeks. And that's how it started. So we became all of a sudden famous. Uh, and uh, I became a liaison person with uh, foreign correspondents because a lot of uh, members of our group became arrested. They've been put in psychiatric clinics and by the word of the mouse, it starts spreading out and of course, those articles in newspapers and cards in New York Times, uh, Los Angeles Times, uh, they help. So little by little, we became known. I remember it was really like in the movie, I meeting with Serge Memon, who was very famous uh, journalist in New York Times at the uh, Danilov Monaster at the dusk giving him some papers about the group, about people who've been arrested. It just was really like in the movie, things like that. Uh, well, Daniel Ellsberg spent with us uh, the whole week. Uh, the Green Party came to us and spent with us in sessions the whole week. A Belgian and French and American, Australian, New Zealand peace activists and human rights activists been flocking to our apartments. And we had an open, well, you see, it's a very long answer, Jerry. Do you have a lot of questions? Um, well, I mean, 
uh, these these journalists they came to see you. I mean, did they actually come up to your apartment and they knock on your door and like? Yes, I mean, they, like this they did the knock on my door. And also in the field, when you saw uh, the coverage by the end, that was a Stuart Lurie, amazing journalist, became very good friend of ours, who started CNN in Moscow. He was the chief of CNN uh, office in Moscow. And he was covering with his camera our arrest very often. We've been under house arrest uh, frequently, which is not part of penal code. What is it? It doesn't exist. Uh, well, it existed on the ground. It didn't exist on paper. So yeah, yeah, yeah they did. So the media was really important and you, you wouldn't have thought thought that that would be the case in the Soviet Union with, uh, the, the, would the, we? You know, that the, that, that the, 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 the foreign Western media there. was, yeah, that the Western media was so important in getting, getting uh, you some, some notice. And then, yeah. and then as a result of that, uh, the Green and, uh, Green and Common women were able to exactly. hear about you and so uh, on. Uh, there is a book written by Anne Petit, another person who came to our apartment, and she's describing that, you know, Green and Common have been facing also difficult times, as you say. They've been portrayed as hooligans and things like that. So, and a very prominent British uh, historian, uh, Edward Thompson, uh, suggests that he said, you cannot just do it on your own. You have to reach your counterparts, counterpart in, in the Soviet Union. And not officials, but people who are doing it from, uh, you know, grassroots movement, and uh, that put them on a different level. Yeah. It also put us on a different level. And of course, my um, the fact how it, we ambushed the Soviet Peace Committee uh, <laughs> never was forgiven uh, to me by the KGB. That's why they put me on um, trial with framed up charges. But it also put our group, uh, you know, in a bright light. And of course, you never know, it may be dangerous, but it's also um, could be a protection. In my case, I think it was both. I can mention one other thing about the media that just, just occurred to me was that uh, I can remember back in 1980, maybe toward the end of 86, beginning of 87, the New York Times had, uh, had an article about Olga and her husband and sort of where are they now kind of piece after they had left the USSR and had come to Ohio. And I, I clipped that article, uh, I remember, and... Uh, showed it to uh, President Kennison. Uh, and uh, so he, he was very interested that we had such a famous uh, faculty member uh, here. Are, are there any, uh, any questions from out here now? I'd like to take. Yes, sir. What is your name? My name is uh, Brett Dipp. I'm a student at Weinberg. And my question is, with all your efforts that are going on today, and also with the rush of the war, in Russia versus Ukraine, do you think that your movement that now compared to, I mean, your movement then compared to the war in Ukraine now has, has, uh, has uh, diminished your efforts or has, do you think it's raising the efforts that even more to find, find some sort of uh, peace or middle ground as far as the, the war or, or some sort of new, uh, some sort of agreement as far as nuclear weapons go. Yeah. Of course, the it's, a good, it's a good and a very, very tough in question. Case, in, in case people haven't, haven't heard the question online, uh, it, it was, you know, does Olga's peace movement have any, any effect at all on, on what's going on today in, 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 Ukraine. in Ukraine? Right. In yeah. Ukraine and in Russia, I assume. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I think you think you're in. Is have do you think it's diminished? Do you think your work from then is significant effect any increase or decrease to, to the war in Ukraine or, or Russia now? Do you think it's influencing people? Right. In your, especially about 
you know, all our work was targeting, we understand we cannot, could not disarm the Soviet Union. And we also understood that it's very difficult to talk about disarmament if people don't trust each other. Uh, that's why we've been working on this trust issue and we have very developed program actually that was picked up later on by Gorbachev. He gave the speech when he came to a high state in the 90s. And um, so I think what we've been doing at that time helped to break the iron curtain and to bring trust and understanding between uh, East and West. Our group was called Group for Establishing Trust East and West. And in the film, it was a segment because already after we've been expelled, it was 87 and 88 and 89, large groups of people been participating in those bridges and those talks. It was already real exchange of people and kids would come and spend time in the United States and vice versa, not from higher ups families, just from regular families. That's what you want, right? And we've been working so hard on that. And you would think that after 30 years, when people could feel some fresh air, and we know they did. And of course, if you ask me, are those changes been fundamental or shallow? I would say both. They've been shallow probably for the whole country. They've been fundamental for people who wanted to live in free society. And we witnessed that. Jerry and I have been bringing our students every other year to Russia. Our students never ever felt hostility or anything like that. They've been always welcome. We brought them to Moscow State University. They had discussions with Russian students. We brought students to the country of Georgia in Olivia sitting here actually went on that trip with us. So it was continued at Wittenberg. I was continue that people to people approach. Now what's happening now is a total disaster. What's happening now blows my mind and breaks my heart because, and I, uh, I'm on Facebook with my friends who still, and some of them, former members of our trust group. And once in a while, I can see they can trickle down something on Facebook. And when they can get through VPN or something like that, they can post what they really think, but they're now facing up to 15 years in prison. And what does major, and of course we saw those uh, demonstrations in the streets of Moscow in St. Petersburg and other cities against the war. But it's such a little trickle, it's just it's such a small, it, it's dangerous, it's scary. You think after 30 years of quasi freedom, it would be more than that. But when I see that members of the same very family, relatives who are in Ukraine and in Russia talk to each other and Ukrainians show them what's happening on the ground, People in Russia don't believe them. They say no, 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 no. Because all channels cut off. They are, uh, it's again back to our Valian society. They spoon the propaganda by Putin machine and nothing else is available. And it's such a setback. It's just, it's just impossible to imagine that it's happening right now. All of this is to testify to Olga's courage when she did it uh, and faced off against the official Soviet Peace Committee. And so, Olga, how did that feel? I mean, what were you, I mean, the, 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 what have you been thinking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how did that feel to do that? You're sitting there, the actress playing Olga, sitting there smoking a cigarette, which she used to do. So. But it kept you busy. <laughs> <laughs> How did that feel? I mean, that must have been terribly frightening. Uh, it was frightening. 
but I happened to be on that spot and it was no way back. And as Chris said in this field, not doing anything was even more frightening. For me, the last straw was an invasion to Afghanistan. And I was in the Academy of Science. That was 1979. Thank you. Uh, um, I was working in the Academy of Sciences. And it doesn't matter where you work, you had those brainwashing sessions by party uh, leaders. And I never been a party member, but even more so, I had to be brainwashed. That's understandable. So nobody paying any attention to what this person is saying. Everybody proving articles, checking, you know, student papers. And of course, she's saying that Soviet Union, you know, have this brotherhood held and how they saved, uh, you know, Afghan people uh, from <laughs> terrible government. And all of a sudden, something happened to me. I put those papers aside and I saw what the BS. We know she, that it is a BS. She knows that we know that it is a BS. We know that she knows that we know that it is a BS. <laughs> and how long it can go like that. You cannot raise your kids in this environment. It's just crazy. Something has to be done. And here we go. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from online. Yes, well, a statement first from uh, Dr. Wishart. He retired in spring of 2021, a colleague and a friend. Um, he first wanted to thank you for all that you've done. And then also just let you know that it's an honor to be your colleague and friend. Uh, but then we get into the deep and it's um, networks played a big role as a peace activist and they continue to play a big role. A network technology has two economic attributes increasing marginal utility with increasing use and economies of scale, which is the more of the good produced, the lower average cost. I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the question. Do you think democracy can emerge as a network technology of sorts to states ruled by autocrats? Um, technology, of course, is very helpful in promoting and dispersing ideas. Of course, autocrats can cut it off. People in Russia, almost said in the Soviet Union, because it feels like that, don't have access to any news. But of course, I wish we had internet then in the 80s. We would have done so much more. I don't know how we achieved what we achieved with uh, you know, very, very limited tools. But as we learn, I hope we learn, you really cannot bring democracy to autocratic society. You think you can, but it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. It's people in those countries uh, when they're ready for that. And it may not happen right away. I'm so sorry Russia has a slightly, such a setback, but sometimes, it takes several steps back before making one step forward, or unfortunately, several generations back before you'll go forward. Look at Arab Spring. It looked like such a great development, but look how bloody and costly uh, it turned. So it's, it's not very simple. Technology is very helpful, but people are the most important agents. And Dave, thank you. I love you dearly. And, and Joe too. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? Do we have any from online? We do have one more. Oh, oh, uh, oh, oh OK. Can, can you Wait a second. Question? You, Ben? Ben, take, uh, take the mask off. <laughs> I studied Soviet military as a graduate student in Stanford, but I saw the Russian fight while visiting the United States and start on Asia. Um, 
So what you can use as a non person who's going to adopt it. But the postal way of coming back to the partial adopted person is going to be a device is going to be adopted separate time. Yesterday, the new sector, gentlemen, actually talked about that in the COVID world, insulin collectance is almost impossible. Now it's in the realm of possible, but like that is is post solely. Even it's a question. How do you wrestle with this? Uh, so the Indian Gurbis Hoffman is uh, at the hour of the three. Now the French and the post is uh, much, much more dangerous than COVID. You're correct. You want to yeah, just to repeat the question uh, in case for the online listeners, uh, Dr. You've been has said, you know, it's, it's, it's a rather ironic thing that during Soviet times, uh, the, that the USSR agreed with the United States that deterrence would work, that, 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 that we wouldn't have first use of nuclear weapons yet now, uh, Russia seems uh, to be going uh, to the doctrine that it might be the first to use nuclear weapons and how do how are we wrestling with that, Olga? You sound like my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it, it, it didn't sound like a compliment, right? <laughs> yeah, it didn't meant to be. Um, yeah, it, it's a very tough question, but what I think about Putin, and of course, nobody has a crystal ball, including me. I don't think he is for the destruction of the world. I think it's a small man with a very big ego who wants to be remembered in history as Peter the Great, who brought this greatness, this territory, this people back to his empire and that's what he's doing with ukraine uh, i was in moscow in 2005 in may and may 9th it's a victory day and he was given very big speech in the red square when he said that he thinks that the largest tragedy of the previous century is a disintegration of the soviet union and not sure knowing geography and relationship between the people and different cultures of the Soviet Union, not sure he's after Central Asia, um, but Belarus, which is already in his pocket, thanks to rigged elections and Lukashenko uh, owes him big time. And if he'll bring Belarus and Ukraine into Russian orbit, you know, Russians still have that phantom pain of cut off legs and arms. They've been big, never mind they've been poor, but they've been big. It was a mighty empire compared only militarily to United States uh, until they could not keep up with these pathways. I think that he is into that. I really don't think he'll go into NATO because it's suicidal. And he's not a suicidal guy. I, I just hope, I just hope that they would not start a, because a nuclear war, because it's destruction for the whole world and for, for him uh, included. Uh, I know, you think I am naive, I see it in your eyes, I see it in, <laughs> I, I see it in the eyes of my husband, but you know. <laughs> Unrebuilt in the 
United States never had a declared no fish. It doesn't mean the United States wouldn't do it, right? Well, it doesn't mean we never do it. Right, right. Obama tried, but he was bounced back by right. those talks. I think a real short answer is that deterrence works. And that's why we have a no, we're not engaging in no-fly zone in Ukraine. We're afraid that it could escalate to a nuclear war. That's the message we're sending to Russia, that deterrence works. So I think that the system of nuclear deterrence um, seems to be working. Uh, who, who, who knows, but that's... Uh, do we have another online? We do, and it kind of piggybacks off of the last question. Um, Evan, I hope I don't put your last name, uh, Stefanik. Stefanik. Uh, Stefanik, there we mm -hmm. go, from class 97. Uh, he presented us with a fill in the blank. So, nuclear weapons were to the disarmament and peace movement in the 80s as X is to Y today. So in other words, what would be a new project for you um, if the peace movement has transformed? I think it should be a new project for Ivan <laughs> <laughs> to continue what we've been doing in the 80s. All right. Like so so what's, a, what's Olga's new project? And she said? I said it should be a new project for Ivan in his generation yeah. <laughs> to continue right. what we've been doing in the 80s. That's right. It's yeah. nice to hear from Evan again. Yeah. Yeah. James, did you have a question? Yeah. This, this is Dr. Allen, chair of the political science department. Um, <laughs> so, um, so one thing that struck me about the, the film, um, I, I grew up in Britain. Um, you sound that. like you did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, this is like a sort of weird flashback for that time in the early 80s. Right. Um, I've, been, I've been calling women for, for all the years. I mean, I recall that I had no idea about the Soviet mm -hmm. Um But that was just uh, part of, of my um, growing up you know, in that period in Britain. Um, but one thing that struck me that that period in the early 1980s, we've seen Thatcher, Reagan, Reagan, everyone. Um, it, it was just a very grim time in Britain. Yeah. Never mind everywhere else. Um, but, but there was a sense, in, and um, Carmen Thomas alluded to this, getting this, sort of, this general sense of doom that um, nuclear war was going to be somewhere red. Like, right. Like, documentaries. Right. Um, and, and from a, living in Britain, we all knew sort of chemical plant nearby, we had uh, US naval bases and only a lot of physical mm -hmm. voice notes. Um, and this this just sense of some of it didn't really matter in Britain it was that if it was Reagan or, or, or Soviet. Um, and I, I wonder if if if, if that was it generally felt elsewhere as well, in the United States well for that matter, or in the Soviet Union so our for for people in so we think at that time so thinking that this this conflict is practical and and somehow it's there. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Do you want to repeat the question for well what uh, Dr. Allen was uh, asking whether or not in the USSR whether people in the in the Soviet Union back in the 80s had the same feeling as was the case in Britain where Dr. Allen grew up and was living, um, whether they had the same view that nuclear war was going to be inevitable or not. And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but of course, uh, Soviets being, uh, you know, Soviet propaganda was that Soviet people would be victorious and they would survive. And they've been teaching how to survive nuclear winter. And I mean, nothing can kill us, right? And of course it would be Americans who are aiming their uh, nuclear missiles uh, to the Soviet Union. And it was all kind of training, all kind of bunkers built around all kind of shelters. Yeah, it was absolutely real. 
has any other online? Yes, we have a former student and fellow traveler, uh, Taylor Halfley, class of 2010, geography major. Uh, she started off with a really sweet note here. Or he started off with a really sweet note there, too. Uh, Olga, you know I love you. You're the best. I'm forever lucky that our time at Wittenberg overlapped. For those who weren't lucky enough to have you as a professor and as a tour guide in Moscow, also, hi, Dr. Hudson. Uh, <laughs> what explains your motivation and willingness to travel back to a place where you were arrested, followed, forced, but to follow, to go back there with your students? Taylor, I never thought you would you would sound like my husband. <laughs> the first thing Yuri said, are you crazy to go back to Russia? But in 90s, Russia was really changing. And it was a feeling that it can be a different country. Under Yeltsin, it was very difficult to leave um, economically, like from day to day life. People been selling two eggs on the street to make some change. Not two dozens, two eggs. That was very, very hard. But political debates, I was watching TV until five in the morning. And before I left Soviet Union, it was only Soviet propaganda on TV. It's been political debates everywhere, social issues, I was so, uh, jealous, but my friends, uh, one of my friends, and Jerry knows him, and our students know them, uh, him, uh, Professor uh, Smirnyagin, who, who was advisor to Yeltsin. So he would invite me to Kremlin and said, Olga, you want to check Kremlin mail? Let's, let's look into that, you know? <laughs> and then two in the morning, oh, I have to ask general of KGB to give you a pass uh, from Kremlin back to, uh, and when we would bring our students, like my friends, my colleagues, they would be in such wonderful and powerful positions. They would give them lectures and seminars and tours. And it was really exciting time. And I couldn't explain that, bring them to places which I knew so well and uh, uh, to not to fake and picture perfect places, but to real places, to real people. So I thought it would be so powerful besides, um, you know, it's just people to people diplomacy. I wanted Americans and we have some marriages, uh, you know, oh, yeah. Russian American marriages after our uh, trips among our <laughs> students. So that was a contribution. Um, but when I got, Fulbright, and I told my husband that I was approved. I didn't tell him when I was approved in Russia. I told him only when I was approved already by American side that I am leaving for a semester to teach in Russia in 2003. He was like, for the whole semester being in Russia? That's crazy. And it was in winter. It was crazy. But it was, <laughs> but it was great. And Mike and Marsha, my kids visited me there and they said, you're doing great. That's what you're suffering. I said, do I look like I'm suffering? And then, then Jerry brought our students uh, by the end of May and we all uh, did our, you know, educational tour in Moscow and then in St. Petersburg. Uh, it was great. And Taylor, you benefited from that. But after 2008, when uh, Russia invaded the country of Georgia, and it already was obvious that Russia is rolling back on human rights and on all social issues and think, um, I said, Jerry, let's take our students to the country of Georgia. I think we had enough trips to Russia, and that's how it went. Yeah. I love you, Taylor. <laughs> I just have a. Did Yuri never go back to Russia? Never. Never. Yuri said, "If you escape from the cave of the cannibal, why do you want to check on his appetite?" <laughs> <laughs> just a little story about those heady days, and they were heady because, I mean, everything was up for debate and up for grabs and so on, and. Olga, one evening, 
we'd been out to a nice restaurant in Moscow. And she said, Jerry, I want to take you on a little tour. And we went around on a tour of the various police stations where she had been put in the clink for her demonstration activities. And so we went, I don't yeah, know, how many we missed it? You know, restaurants, it should be something for balance. Restaurants, <laughs> police stations, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Dr. Jerry Pankhurst has a question. Yeah. Um, thank you for having this, Dr. Hanson and Jerry, for organizing this process. I'm, this is really an excellent forum. I'm thrilled. I've seen this movie before, but it made me cry again. You know, when oh. things were really hard. You were in a tough place. I just want to say, um, first, thank you. But uh, as some of you know, uh, I know Oprah pretty well. And uh, well, I was sitting here, mm -hmm. my phone shook, <laughs> and it was. Uh, message on Telegram from my friends in Moscow. Uh, and we have an agreement. I will not write him because if he's stopped on the street by the police, they'll look at his phone and they'll see somebody from the United States. Right. If he writes me, I can write him back. Right. But he will delete the message very shortly, and he just did. Uh, but uh, I, So my phone shook while I was sitting here watching this. And um, he told me, I know that his wife and daughter were arrested Friday in the demonstrations in Moscow. Went to the court today, and I kept thinking, I just saw this in the movie, you know, right. 30 years ago, 40 I know. years ago, whatever. I know. So the, the need for this kind of demonstration, which really did lead to those results, Jerry worked on those trees. That stuff was all related to the popular uprisings at the time. Um, and now we have to go through another cycle, it appears. And I hope that these people in Russia can mobilize enough. I'm not sure how far they can go, but miracles have happened before, and hopefully they will again. Yeah. So anyway, I, you know, what what would you say to these people in Moscow and Russia now? The question for online people, in case they couldn't hear it, was that Dr. Pankhurst is, is wondering whether we're going through another cycle of repression in Russia and what Olga would advise those people who are protesting the war, who are demonstrating, and there's actually a fairly good number of them, not huge, nice. but there are, you know, what, is, what is Dr. Medvedkov gonna advise them to do? Well, I'll tell you just a short story. Every December, uh, we get together on one of the major squares in Moscow in memory of uh, people who've been, uh, who vanished in Gulag and Soviet uh, uh, political camps. And uh, we would be arrested on the spot in two minutes, uh, maybe five the most if police is uh, real slow. In <laughs> uh, one year, a very old woman, Babushka, came to us and she said, I live across the square and I see every year how you're getting arrested immediately. Why are you doing it? You cannot change the system. And one of the very prominent uh, dissidents, uh, Vladimir Bukowski said, maybe we cannot change the system but we stand in here, so the system wouldn't change us. And till now, I'm having goosebumps when I'm saying that. And that's what we did. And if more people would have done that, Russia would be a different country right now. And what your friend is doing, they're taking a stand not to be changed by this autocratic society. And it's very tough. It's scary, um, but some people just, for some people, uh, enough is enough. Other questions here? Yes, ma'am. Olivia. Hi. Um, so I That's Olivia Igel, class of, 16. no, 2016. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's all right. 2016, not high school. <laughs> Okay. You look much younger. <laughs> yeah. um, 
So I was fortunate enough to go to UC to see the Republic of Georgia in 2012, about 10 years ago. Um, and I do still have a lot of friends from there to remember. I can't. Uh, my other friend, uh, Nina, from East Um And there's a lot of um, uproar from them on social media about what's going on in Ukraine. Because obviously it's very fresh in the mind. It's not too long ago. We're in LA. So, what do you think as far as the countries? To repeat the question for online, uh, Olivia was asking uh, about, gosh, what are the implications for people living in Georgia? Some of her friends there are terrified that Russia is going to do something. And what about what about Poland? What about the Baltic countries? What do you uh, foresee? Well, again, I don't have a crystal ball, just to remind not everybody maybe remember what happened in Georgia. Uh, uh, Russia invaded Georgia in 2008 and they annexed uh, as, um, Abkhazia, which is on the Black Sea and Southern Ossetia, which is on the border with Russia, of course, before they've been given Russian passports to many people there than to declare that those Russians been uh, abused by Georgians. And of course, there's been some friction and issues between different ethnicity and stuff like that. But Russians are very good to put salt on the wound. And those areas have been annexed uh, by Russia and they still they consider to be independent, but how independent those little islands can be. They're in Russian sphere of influence. And planes being really close to the capital of Georgia, Tbilisi, and people being absolutely terrified. Now, Georgia wanted to be uh, part of NATO and part of EU. So did Ukraine at that time. And uh, at that point, Putin announced that Ukraine never been its own country and they shouldn't even think to become part of the EU or NATO. Now what's happening in Georgians, they've been terrified by what happened in 2008. But then we had a lot of friends and colleagues and they're all in politics and one of them was Georgian ambassador in the United States, and they're really, uh, really think tank people, but they've been, I think, all kind of glad that it stopped there, that they still have their country, and it was a status quo. And now a lot of Russians who are leaving Russia and who cannot get somewhere else immediately are coming to Georgia and they're not welcome in most of the cases, maybe because of the Russian invasion, but obviously people who are running from Russia uh, that invaded Ukraine, not for military invasion, but they also afraid if Russians are finding refuge in Georgia, what Russia will do to Georgia. What can you do? Poles are doing that. They just doing wonderful things for Ukrainians and they are scared. But, you know, when I was scared and I was scared very often in my situation, what you hold on you hold on to your integrity 
because it doesn't matter what happened, you have to live with yourself after that. You can try to explain your behavior. Of course, it's scary, I'm pregnant. I have eight years, eight years old. Mike uh, at home and I'm going to jail and KGB trying to make advances to make some kind of agreement with me that the whole group would be dissolved if I also I should agree not to be at the um, trial as a member of trust group, just like a hooligan, you know, and you think it's just a little bit, you just give a little bit, you really not betray anybody, but they never stop. If you can give a little bit, they'll go more and more and more. And it's not only the single person, it's with the nation, with the country. I mean, Ukrainians are amazing. I think they would be happy to say, okay, Donbass and Lugansk and Crimea is yours anyway, by de facto. But Russians most likely want, if not to take the whole country, but uh, the whole Black Sea and uh, eastern part of Ukraine included Kyiv, and who knows if they even want to leave the western part of Ukraine to Ukrainians. It's just horrible. And I understand that Georgians are afraid, but Russians wouldn't fight on both sides. At least I don't think so. Sorry, I have such oh, long yes. answers for your questions, guys. <laughs> President Fred. Said that it's difficult to replace an autocrat with a democracy. What are your thoughts on the reverse? Replacing democracy. Oh, we, we <laughs> saw we saw in this country that it was happening. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was really suffering. I was thinking I, I'm back in the Soviet Union. But democratic society still would not allow that to happen to blossom. You know, it might be some setback. Yeah, Trump sounded to me as total autocrat. And, uh, but America is, American democracy, of course, not perfect. And there is no such a thing as perfect democracy because it's work in progress. But it, it made such a big progress. I believe that even these short uh, setbacks cannot get it off the democratic track. One of the things about a democracy, if I might just add something quickly, it's a great question, is that democratic countries like the United States have institutions that work and they provide checkpoints that help to prevent autocracies from rising too quickly. And I think we saw our last election was such a checkpoint, just such, a, such an institution, maybe I'm being too optimistic, uh, but I don't think so. Um, the, the difference with Russia is profound uh, because there are institutions that's, that looked like, as Olga was talking about, was going to start uh, real institutional development in the 1990s. Um, they were stopped. It was stopped. Yeah. And it wasn't the only Putin that stopped it. Yeltsin started to undermine them too. And uh, now, of course, uh, what we've got is sort of a personalist autocracy that is existing. And so I'm not going to go on anymore. <laughs> we wanted to, this is Olga's uh, Q&A, not mine. Um, are there any more questions from on, online? We don't have anything else. Okay, but we do have one from over here. Why not? Well, one uh, class 97. So one of the things that's interesting is we kind of demonstrate here. Can you speak to the, how it worked with like the, the social interaction? Back then you didn't have Twitter, Telegram, all that stuff like that to get things off the ground. You didn't have email even at that point. Right. Could you kind of speak of how that, you know, how it was back then to like organize the stuff you didn't have all the social media websites? I know. It was very, very, I, didn't, I don't know how we did it. Uh, our telephone was cut off. Nobody could call us. Our mailbox was arrested. It was by word of the mouth. And people been learning about that. And, uh, you know, we had all this open 
door policy. By the matter, uh, as a matter of fact, when Green and Common came to Moscow, Yuri and I were like left for an hour or so, and Mike led them in because we always, uh, you know, it's all your fault, Mike. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's always been open policy. Yes, yeah, sometimes it would be KGB guys who are present at our seminars uh, because we didn't check anybody's identities. And my mom will come and say, do you know everybody here? I said, no. And when everybody is leaving, she said, I'll go count silver. Like we had, <laughs> like we had any silver at home. So it was just, it's amazing how it was and geography of that was very interesting. West Germany, actually a uh, son of famous German uh, writer, Hendrik Grohl, visited us together with Green Party. So it was spreading through uh, Western journalists, uh, you know, big time, very easily. Of course, we never saw peace activists from East Germany or Poland or Czechoslovakia because nobody knew about us. And of course, it would be dangerous for them to do just as well. We also had meeting places in Moscow where dissidents usually would meet. Uh, interesting enough, uh, every uh, Saturday we've been meeting at the near synagogue. And you think it would be only Jews near synagogue? No, Baptist, Seventh-day Adventists who've been really uh, harassed by, by the Soviet government, by KGB. Everybody, everybody who'd been thinking not in the mainstream would be there. And of course, KGB would be around. And we had some of that. Um, Self-publishing. Uh, self but self-publishing was on the typewriter with a copy and, uh, you know, spreading around. And if that typewriter would be found in your apartment, you're facing jail sentence. And yeah, it was, um, it was not easy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, good question. Well, I think we're, I'll take one more question and then we're going to uh, call it an evening. Yes, ma'am. I would like to know what's happening to the people that are arrested in Russia right now that this is a, because I think I saw as many as 6,000 in one and I'd like to know where they're going. Are they incarcerated? Okay, so the question is for the online viewers, what's happening to the people who are being arrested now? I mean, the 6,000 or so, where are they going? Well, several days ago, uh, the uh, Russian parliament uh, added new paragraph, so Russian pinnacle, that if anybody expressing new views opposite to the government in writing or in their action, facing up to 15 years in prison. <laughs> and it works in retrospect. That's really new invention. You um, mean re retroactive? Uh, uh, no, <laughs> retroactive, sorry. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry understands my rules wish very well. <laughs> uh, of course, they would not imprison all 6,000, but they might make a showcase out of some people for those journalists whose channels been cut off. Uh, they, some of them been fleeing even without uh, going back home, <laughs> just getting on a plane if they only could because very few planes live in Russia. You still could get to Istanbul or to Tbilisi in Georgia or to Armenia and maybe for Armenian travel somewhere. You cannot go to the West directly because, uh, you know, planes uh, are not accepted there. They cannot land there. So it's very, very tough. Yeah, people would be arrested. Look what they be, they're doing with Navalny. Navalny, when Putin is alive, probably will never see the light. Navalny is the main opposition figure. <laughs> well, I had one, yeah, one more oh, question. I just wanted to know what what, for, what has this movement, this all this work that you've done had a social impact on you personally? 
for your work, everything that you've done. What, how, how is this done? How does, how does, how has this, all this work done? Had it, how has it done? Has it, how has it done? Has it, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, has how it affected me? Personally, yeah, overall, in your life. I think I just became a better person. Better person. With better values and better understanding who I am. And um, yeah, it kind of grounded me, you know, like, um, yeah, of course it was tough, but you know, what doesn't kill us, make us stronger, maybe. Thank you very much uh, to the audience. And I give the floor back to Dr. James Allen to say some parting words. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'd particularly like to thank um, Paul Beth and Jay um, for this great discussion. Um, I do believe there's a, a, a short reception outside. Um, afterwards, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.